morning, lovelies. Welcome to part two of the Evil Empire series. Last time we talked about some general literary uses for the Evil Empire, some pros and cons, and the moral nuance and debates that such a trope causes. Today we're getting into the more nitty-gritty realism aspect of it by talking about how real-life empires get started. A lot of the information in this video comes straight from Hello Future Me's Empire series, which is really great and you should totally check it out, but I thought I would do my own spin on this, especially since the next two videos will be about maintaining and defeating evil empires, which I promise are not just ripped off from his channel. Before we get started, I would like to give my fellow world builders a quick reminder that my ultimate world building checklist is available on my website and is for free on my Patreon. I also offer one-on-one -on -one coaching services also on my website, links in the description. Anyway, on to the good stuff. Empires have to start somewhere, and they're usually from pretty humble beginnings. A single small country, or even just one city. Rome started as a handful of villages that became an alliance to defend themselves against those pesky invaders, and then leveled up their military and took over the known world. Although they didn't actually call themselves an empire until well after this stage, still calling themselves a republic for 500 years. Which leads to an interesting question, at what point does a country become an empire? Is it when they conquer just one other kingdom? Two? Three? What about peaceful annexations? Look, if I tried to break this down, we would be here all day. But it does make finding the starting point of an empire a bit trickier. Since empires do have to spring from pre-established countries, we'll start there. You can't conquer your enemies without an army, after all. But why would they even want to conquer other lands? How do they choose which ones to start with and which to ignore? Governments have to be very careful about which wars they fight and who to make their enemy. Because if they pick a war that they cannot win, that's it. Game over. Usually, targets are picked for empires because of their resources. They have something that your aspiring empire wants or needs. Coal for their ships, humans for slave labor, spices for trade. Part of the reason Britain founded the American colonies was because their tiny island could not grow tobacco the way that Virginia or Carolina can, and that crop was in very high demand at the time. Britain used it to sell to other nations, which filled up their treasury, which allowed them to buy more land and ships, giving them more power. Spain cut out the middleman of tobacco entirely and went straight for the gold of Central and South America. Sure, they set up sugar plantations that did the same thing Britain was doing, but that wasn't the main attraction. In fact, they brought back so much gold and silver that it crashed their economy, essentially ending their own empire through their greed. Poetic. When it comes to fantasy and sci-fi, you can of course create any number of fantastical, magical resources that your aspiring empire needs for greatness. Or you can use real-life resources in new, magical ways. In Full Metal Alchemist, Spoilers, by the way. The entire country of a mistress was a mistress? A mistress? I, it's been ages since I watched the show. I don't know how to pronounce it. I'm terribly sorry. Anyway, it was founded by an immortal homunculus who wanted to do a ritual that would grant him obscene power, essentially making him a god. But that ritual requires a ton of human sacrifices within a circular border that acts as an oversized ritual circle. Which is why, over the course of centuries, this homunculus chose specific targets and areas for expansion, both to get that circular shape and because as it needed historical areas of obscene violence, like, like the Ishval genocide, to happen at specific points in this ritual circle. Consider the homeland of your aspiring empire. What resources does it need that they don't have? If they are particularly small, well then they probably lack a lot of them. Then ask, where is this resource elsewhere in the world? That's where they're going to start conquering or marrying into or otherwise obtaining so they can get that resource. This is also going to inform the empire's larger strategy. How are they going to get that? If this resource is across the ocean or scattered through a bunch of islands, or if the empire's homeland is itself on an island, they're probably going to specialize in naval trade, which means securing strategically vital ports in addition to hot spots of their desired resource. If the desired resource is, say, in the desert, well then they're going to need to stock up on the proper gear and conquer any sources of drinking water in the area. Air travel will be very handy since that cuts down travel time that could otherwise destroy their army with thirst and heat stroke. If there's a magical or technological element that allows them to produce water out of thin air, they're going to be very interested in obtaining 
that too. You can also do the inverse. If the Empire already controls a bunch of these resources, then they might not want other people to control it. They'll want to monopolize it instead, either for economic reasons or, if this is a resource that can be weaponized, security reasons. This is why in the modern world of gas and cars, areas of land that have high deposits of oil are a especially valuable to us. There's also the question of how they control the people after they've conquered them. If the locals are a necessity, say for the invader's survival or finding and obtaining this resource, well then they're probably going to be a lot nicer to them than, say, if they can just take the resource and leave or throw a bunch of manual labor into the mines or factories or whatever they need to extract that resource. Locals can absolutely double as slave labor. The American colony's relationship with the Native Americans was never particularly great, but it was a lot better in the early days when we relied on them for trading food so we wouldn't starve. Once the colonists got their feet under them and got a healthy population going, well then we didn't need the natives anymore. And this led to the removal of their land and a long history of atrocities against them. Of course, this is all assuming that the empire has to take the land by force. While this is what usually happens, people tend to like the land they're living on and want to control it, it's not always the case. Sometimes other countries do ask to be a part of this empire, usually for protection or resources. But they'll only do that if they know that the empire is going to treat them right or improve their lives in some way. And if the empire does not want to spend the next few decades standing out rebellions, they'll do just that. Of course, they won't ask in the first place if the empire always treats its conquered lands like shit. War is expensive. So if there is a way to bloodlessly exert economic power on these other countries or colonies via tariffs or taxes or different trades or bribes, the empire is far more likely to go with that option until it becomes unsustainable, or outright conquest looks like the better, more affordable option. You can also start your empire building process by conquering trade routes rather than hubs of resources themselves. Lots of countries fought over the Silk Road because it was the only over route between Europe and Asia. If you controlled that road, well then you can extort all the traders and their home countries for ridiculous amounts of money to travel on your road. Genghis Khan also took the opportunity to destroy all the other roads to the south, forcing all the traders to pass through his Mongolia. The Suez Canal pops up time and time again in modern history because it's a vital trade route between the Red Sea and the Mediterranean, which connects to the rest of the world. Britain and France wanted to control in the days of their empires because that's how one gets resources from Egypt and deeper Africa to the rest of the world. Egypt, of course, wanted to control that too. By controlling their canal, Egypt controls who trades what on their turf. In Game of Thrones, House Frey built their fortune by building the Twins, a set of towers over the Trident River. It's one of the main points of crossing that dangerous river, and because of that, they charge anyone and everyone who wants to use their bridge, especially if there's a noble who needs to move their army down south on a tight schedule. Catelyn Stark said it best, the Freys have held the crossing for 600 years, and for 600 years they have never failed to exact their toll. This is the source of House Frey's wealth, and not the control of resources, but control over whether or not they go anywhere. If you can't trade your resources or move your armies in a timely manner, they're useless. If there's a specific road, river, space route, or whatever in your world that various countries need to use to transport goods or armies, that might be a good place to start setting up shop as an empire. They might have to conquer it, or they might just be the first to claim it, and through various trade deals, diplomatically build their empire that way. Once they get more power, then they can be properly abusive with it to fit that evil empire aesthetic you're going for. The second most common reason that empires form or strike out at another nation is for security. I mentioned before that Rome got started partially because a bunch of Latin-speaking cities and kingdoms banded together to protect themselves against foreign invaders, and then things built up from there. In the Giant Empire series, the Sukai Empire was originally started to fight off the Alanga, supernaturally powerful beings. 
as in you know, two Alanga had a little spat over who took the remote that was over by lunchtime, but three human cities got destroyed in the process. Elon Sukai, and I really hope I'm pronouncing these names right, Andrea Stewart if you're watching this, I'm sorry. Anyway, Elon Sukai, way back in the first days, found a way to destroy the Alanga using something called Bone Shard Magic. And once he did, he united all of the islands under his banner because he knew that they could one day return. The need for security against such a horrifying threat was enough to get everyone on board with it. And even with things like the tithing festival, where every child of a certain age, is like 8, 9, or 10, is forced to give up a chunk of their skull to create fantasy robots that power the empire. His army. While it started sympathetically enough, over the centuries the Sukai Empire devolved into outright tyranny, making it an evil empire. But the threat that forced the islands to band together in the first place was, and is, very real, and that history is taught and reinforced to its citizens constantly to remind them of why they do this. If a government has reason to believe that another government or entity is going to cause security problems, they might think it's necessary to strike first regardless of whether or not that threat actually exists. It's one of the many reasons why America invaded the Middle East. We thought they had weapons of mass destruction, and we didn't want to get nuked. Turns out we were wrong. Oops. So what are some major threats to your aspiring empire in its early fledgling days that would get them into gear, real or imagined? If they don't have an easy way to defend against threats, they're going to want them. Part of the reason America has such a hard time in Vietnam and Korea is because of the dense jungles that are extremely hard to navigate, while the locals could just up and disappear and then regroup. You're not getting through that without straight up bombing the place, and that's gonna cause a lot more problems than it solves. This is why coastlines, mountains, dense jungles, or forests, and deserts are so valuable as borders. They're easy to defend against invaders. If your aspiring empire is landlocked on a prairie or steppe that are somewhere else that the army can just march right over, they're gonna want to expand their borders to more easily defend themselves. Finally, we have nationalism. This is a very complicated ideology that roughly means strongly identifying with your own nation and support for its interests, including or especially at the detriment of others. Very much, we're number one, everyone else can suck it. This is not to be confused with patriotism, which is just simply love of one's country. Nationalism is a fairly modern concept, although it has been around in some form or another for centuries. But we'll stick with the examples that everyone knows for the sake of time. World War I, World War II, and of course, the Fire Nation. World War I had a bunch of causes, ranging from military expansion among the European powers to a complex series of alliances to nationalism. Basically, everyone thought that their country was number one, and thus they had the right to those African colonies, or to expand their borders, or to do pretty much whatever they wanted. This inflated sense of pride is one of the reasons nobody backed out of the conflict when they should have. Everyone thought, eh, we can take them and be home by Christmas. And I mean, the war did end in November, four years later. That, that, that's, that's before Christmas, right? Okay. This wasn't just confined to Europe. Japan was getting hit with nationalist fever at the same time, thanks to a massive surge of technological and military growth, combined with the need to return to the past, or rather their own cultural roots in the face of all these Westerners showing up on their shores, as well as the idea of the emperor's supreme authority over everything. All of this, combined with political reform and economic development, led to the first Sino-Japanese War, Russo-Japanese War, and the annexation of Korea, officially getting the empire started. The Meiji Restoration and start of Imperial Japan is a great study in how an acceleration of technology, economics, and other new things can create an almost desperate need in its people to return to their old familiar ways, now that everything around them is new and strange. Since that's not going to happen, they instead cling to a radicalized cultural identity that leads straight to nationalism, and that can be very dangerous. Germany's nationalism after the First World War was a little different. While Japan's nationalism stemmed from and grew from a series of victories, Germany's World War II nationalism came from a series of defeats. They lost World War I, 
which was bad enough. Then they were forced to pay the bill for it, which was even worse, and that bankrupted them even before the Great Depression took its toll. The other European powers took some of their most historic and culturally rich territories like the Rhine, which was humiliating and honestly done just to kick them while they were down. This of course created the perfect environment for Adolf Hitler to seize power and assure everyone that Germany is just the best. Look, guys, we have been horribly wronged here, but that's okay. We can return to our former glory and get revenge on all the people who have done this to us. Although Hitler was obviously guided in many of his decisions by the need for resources and security, nationalism was the biggest driving force for him personally. And he used that to fire up the rest of his country to do what he wanted them to do. Once he used nationalism to get things going, it's very hard to stop. Left unchecked, it usually gets more and more extreme, until the idea of taking over the world because you're just so darn awesome sounds downright reasonable. If your empire is particularly nationalist, figure out if that came from strife or from prosperity, because that's going to alter not just the tone of their philosophy, but also their motivation for invading other countries, which is going to have a major impact on their overall strategy. If it's nationalism out of strife, well, then they're probably in it for revenge. Of course, good news for the good guys, this also means that they're far more likely to make key strategic mistakes which is what Adolf Hitler did multiple times, especially near the end of the war. If it's nationalism out of pride and prosperity, well, then it's more of a righteous duty to share their way of life with the rest of the world. And if the rest of the world doesn't like it, well, then what do you expect? They are not nearly as advanced as we are, the poor savages. They don't know any better. We must show them a better way, by force if necessary. It's our duty. This was the general attitude of the Fire Nation in Avatar The Last Airbender. Sozin started the war because of nationalism. His nation was living in an era of unprecedented wealth and prosperity, and he wanted to share that with the rest of the world, but not in a peaceful trade deals or global scientific society kind of way, more in a our way is the right way, which means I get to be in charge of everyone kind of way. And he believed in this so much that his first act of war was committing genocide against the air nomads, the biggest threat to his plans for world domination. Which tells you something about the mental backflips that some people have to do when they ascribe to this particular ideology. How does death make the world better there, Sozin? I don't see the air nomads being particularly prosperous, do you? Nationalism is a lot more personal than security and resources. I mean, yes, everyone in a society prospers when that society has easier access to certain resources and has more secure borders. But those things tend to be handled by the government, all right? They're viewed by the common citizen in more distant, abstract ways. Unless there is a foreign invasion breathing down their next, they're probably not going to be thinking about that stuff. Nationalism is different. It's a whole philosophy and way of thinking. And when a state relies on nationalism to get its citizen to do what it needs to do, then it's going to go out of its way to push nationalism on its citizenry. Schools especially. Because if you can teach kids that this is the empire, and this is why it's doing what it's doing, and this is why it's awesome and why everyone else sucks, well then it's going to be a lot harder for those kids to break free out of that mindset when they're adults. Going back to Avatar, we saw this in Season 3, when Aang attends the Fire Nation school. The school was teaching kids blatant lies about its history because Fire Lord Sozin defeated the Air Nomad army in glorious battle sounds a lot better than the Nomads were pacifists who didn't have an army and Sozin defeated them by ambush, slaughtering all of them. That's not going to be great for military recruiting. Nationalism also makes things far more deadly for people who oppose the empire, or even just don't conform to the projected way of life in any way. The thing about empires is that they are, by definition, covering a lot of land in a lot of different countries with a lot of different cultures and subcultures. While an empire can influence the culture of all of its people, it's impossible to force their way of life onto everyone. You can either have a light impact on a lot of people or a strong impact on a few. Non-nationalistic empires like Rome understood this. The gods and the lands they conquered were absorbed into their wider pantheon, allowing the people they conquered to continue worshipping whoever and however they wished, which was not something always done back then. Alexander the Great tended to leave native local leaders in charge of lands he had just conquered, 
especially if they were well liked by the citizenry because they knew how to control the, those specific people way better than he ever could. But a nationalistic empire isn't like that. By definition, they want to force their perfect way of life on everyone they conquer, and this rarely works well for the conquered, especially if things like racism, sexism, and religious intolerance are involved. See Nazis. The level of nationalism is going to affect how your empire treats the people that they conquer. Empires with little to no nationalism are less likely to care if the conquered people keep their cultures, religions, and customs, as so long as they pay their taxes and follow imperial law. But nationalistic empires are going to want to force the people to behave in a certain way way in their day-to-day -day lives, which not only makes the people's lives miserable, it also requires a lot more time, effort, and resources on the empire's behalf, which they could be spending elsewhere, so why aren't they? Why is it so important for them to spend such valuable resources getting these new citizens to conform? That's a question that you're going to have to answer in your story. While most empires rise and make certain decisions because two or even all three of these, resources, security, and nationalism, one of them is usually the main driving factor that gets things going. This driving factor can of course change and evolve over time, like say an empire that originally starts because of lack of resources and then eventually develops a sense of burning nationalism, or an empire that gets started for security reasons and then is driven by the need of specific resources to maintain that empire. Figure out how important each of these three are in your own fantasy empire, both at the start of its formation and at its height, because that is going to help you figure out how your empire works. The next video will explain how empires work and how the emperor maintains it, so subscribe to the channel so you don't miss it. The ultimate world building checklist is still available on my website for 99 cents, linked in the description. It's also available for free on my Patreon, also linked. You can use that to flesh out the details of your sci-fi and fantasy world and the evil empire that controls it. I will see you next time. Bye lovelies.